minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, In the 20th century, mankind took their first steps into the cosmos. The consciousness of an entire planet was transformed. Our species held its collective breath, watching the first humans in history step onto the surface of another world. And we're getting a picture on the TV. That's one small step for man. But then came the inevitable question. What's next? What's next? What's next? With the advent of faster than light travel, the confining limits of our solar system were behind us. And the question was no longer what's next, but what happens to us out there? Imagine the slow crawl to settle planets at the speed of light. Each one a milestone in the growing web of human civilization. each one offering new geologies, ecosystems, and chemistries. New mysteries for religion to reflect on and transform. A new age in the transformation of human consciousness. An age of exploration. Yet all the while, a disease was spreading from planet to planet. Hidden in the subconscious of man, this disease was more insidious than any biological infection. It was an idea. Empire. And thus, the age of exploration turned into an age of colonization.
unlike other science fiction, highlighting advances in technology or the physical geography of human society. Dune sets itself apart in that it doesn't embrace techno-optimism, doesn't idolize endless progress as humanity's salvation, and doesn't posit that mankind's issues can be solved by some new invention. Instead, Dune tells us that salvation lies in our mythological past, in the deep well of psychological images we carry with us from our ancestors, and the even deeper well we're drawing from to create new meaning every day, reimagining and recycling old symbols with each passing generation, and how those ideas influence the landscape of human society. How the thoughts of each and every one of us shape the reality we share. Once out among the stars, spread across hundreds of systems, mankind's various cultures mingled and rearranged, creating new beliefs and thought patterns synthesized from the old, infused with humanity's new experiences of the cosmos. Yet travel at the speed of light was slow across interstellar distances. It would take the discovery of a new property of physics, in the vein of Einstein's relativity or Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, to radically alter the way man interacted across the stars. During an experiment in interstellar communications, a new property of the universe was discovered. A point source node, a node of nothingness, was trapped and triggered by experimental technology. Exciting the node, a bubble, or fold, in space-time occurred. With a little experimentation and carefully applied science, the researchers found that they could control the physical location of the fold, and move anything contained within the bubble at speeds far surpassing that of current FTL engines. The suspensor nullification effect was born. The discoverer had credit stolen by her partner, and the renamed Holtzman effect entered mass consciousness and swept across the empire. But it didn't apply only to ships moving across the vacuum of space. The suspensor nullification effect also unlocked the ability to manipulate gravity and, as more of the effect's properties were discovered, generate energy shields from a small personal emitter rendering ballistic firearms all but useless. The shields, when interacting with laser weapons commonly used across the Empire, created a cataclysmic explosion of nuclear proportions, making their combined use in infantry warfare tactically useless. Every war, if it utilized the most advanced technology available to man, would be a nuclear war. The energy shields were ineffective against objects traveling under certain speeds, speeds that could be controlled by the human hand. The effects this had on combat cannot be understated. Warfare went through a form of regression. The sword play once common on ancient Earth had a return to popularity, as did the form of government this warfare once bred. Old notions of aristocracy were heightened dramatically by mankind's progression in material knowledge. A new era of feudalism was born amidst the stars. Because of the high computational demands of navigating ships using Holtzman engines, this fledgling interstellar empire became very dependent on technology. Technology that had blossomed and expanded in capability, following tracks in the human psyche that had been there from the beginning, developing into something out of mankind's oldest dreams. by the time that technology began thinking for itself. It was already so intertwined with our daily lives we could no longer resist its influences, no longer see how the machines we had built were slowly transforming our minds, reshaping it in their image. The feelings of futility and hopelessness in the face of such passive and inevitable oppression grew, generation after generation until it reached a boiling point in the subconscious of every individual in the Empire. And then... A child was murdered by a machine.
Mankind launched a holy jihad against the very things it had built. A crusade of destruction that swept across every planet, consuming every thinking machine, every subservient computer, every meager calculator and data storage device, and left two generations traumatized by war and conflict. The seeking machines would be there, the smell of blood and entrails, the cowering humans in their burrows aware only that they could not escape. While all the time the mechanical movement approached, louder, louder. This monumental shifting point in mass consciousness came to be known as the Great Revolt, the Machine Crusade, or the Butlerian Jihad, named for the mother of the child who had been slaughtered by the machines, the figurehead for this new age of liberation. Technology, Dune tells us, is necessary to pull our species out of survival and into higher pursuits. Yet at a certain point that trend reverses, and that same technology becomes an oppressor that we must liberate ourselves from. The story of Dune is set 10,000 years after this liberation. Above all else, Dune is a post-technological universe. With humanity disillusioned about technology's ability to reduce suffering, much of the human landscape has returned to the shape it once had on pre-industrial Earth, valuing the organic and handmade over anything machine produced. The working class have returned to the naturalized lifestyles of animal husbandry, farming, or labor, while the wealthy retain access to the stars. A new aristocracy is born, an amplified reflection of what came before. Individual families have amassed enough wealth to control entire planets. Not just their economic outputs, but their weather and climate. Planetologists routinely advise rulers on the effects of manipulating a planet's climate over the long term for political gain. The Great Convention was signed following the suffering of the Machine Crusade, banning the most destructive forms of warfare, especially thinking machines. Computers have been replaced by individuals trained to use their minds to emotionless, mathematical precision, heightened by drugs discovered on the pharmacopoeia planet Ikaz. These speed-thinking mentats, as they are called, run all data-driven functions of human society. They demonstrate the highest capacity of the human mind as a logic-making machine, organizing the material world into data and projections. Because Dune is a world of ideas. Humanity is so intermingled that the concept of race has dissolved. Factions are characterized not by their genetic makeup, but by the beliefs that dominate their society and planet. Loyalty is no longer to kind, but to thought pattern. The Spacing Guild and their affiliates have a monopoly on all interstellar travel, making them the primary source of economic thought in the Empire. The people of the planet Ix are the sole holdout for technology, providing necessary innovation only with the approval of the Imperial government. The Souk School specializes in medicine, training highly advanced physicians available only to the ultra-rich. The Zen Sunni, a wandering people, move from planet to planet with ties to ancient Earth's Nile region and the pharaonic empires that once held there. The Sardaukar represent the pinnacle of mankind's aspirations in training an elite fighting force whose proximity to the royal government indicate the uncomfortable ties between militarism and barbarism. The Tleilaxu have hyper-specialized in genetics, providing clones and genetically modified organisms to the highest buyer. Rumors even hold of their failed attempts at making an improved super-being, far surpassing the capabilities of a normal human. The great spiritual texts were poured over their greatest secrets extracted, consolidated, and rewritten into new scriptures, synthesizing the ideas of once separate religions into a few monoliths of holy thought. One of these was the Azar Book, a library of religious and spiritual teachings from all religions, a guide for the next age. This library led the way for the Orange Catholic Bible, composed by a group known as the Fourteen Sages, it included on its pages the beliefs of every religion with over a million followers at the time of its composition. Its chief commandment, Thou shalt not make a machine, 
in the likeness of the human mind. The secretive group that had organized the Azar book was an all-female organization who called themselves the Bene Gesserit. They had descended from a branch of Zensuni wanderers who made incredible botanical discoveries on the planet Rossak, and claimed to have an understanding of mystical traditions stretching back before recorded history. The Bene Gesserit had long ago discovered that women had greater access to their genetic memory, an outdated science concept that has had some resurgence in recent years in the form of epigenetics. The idea that the stresses a parent experiences in their life are imprinted on their very DNA and passed on to their children. But genetic memory takes this a step further, theorizing that a parent's memories are passed on as well. The Bene Gesserit learned to tap into these memories, going so far as to speak to their ancestors in internal dialogues. This internal awareness, enhanced by psychoactive substances discovered on Rossak, unlocked the memories of their ancestors, stretching back through their genetic lineage. Back to before the Zen Sunni left the Nile region of ancient Earth for their many voyages in space. With this incredible technique, the Bene Gesserit gained the wisdom of many lifetimes through what they called other memory. But navigating the internal landscape with its many voices, identities, and egos was challenging and required immense mental and physical training. Deep conditioning practices were adopted in which the sisters were taught immense powers of body awareness and mental control. Such control did they have over their physical form that adept sisters could manipulate the pitch of their voice to control the wills of others and even adjust bodily chemistry to determine the gender of an embryo she carried. The feminine power long spoken of in myth and legend had, in the practices of these Bene Gesserit, become reality. Everything of the body done with exquisite precision, senses honed to detect smallest details, muscles trained to perform in marvelous exactitude. The arrival of the Bene Gesserit signified the transition from old patriarchal values and deity systems into a new age of worship centered around the Great Mother, where religions were remixed and reformed by those with the deepest knowledge of man's mythological past. If you know all of your ancestors, you were a personal witness to the events which created the myths and religions of our past. No longer were women condemned to the sidelines of history, operating in the shadows. Now they had stepped fully into the light, their unique powers evident to all. As was often the case in history, it was not long before many were calling the Bene Gesserit witches. Centuries before, in the 20th century of Old Earth, the idea of eugenics had taken hold of various political groups. Nietzsche, in his book that popularized the concept of an attainable higher man, wrote, Man is something that must be surpassed. Man is a rope stretched between the animal and the higher man. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. The Ubermensch, the ideal and transcendent man, was characterized differently by each nation-state according to the needs of their ruling political powers. In English, Ubermensch was most often translated as Superman. This kind of thinking, this reaching towards an idealized physical human future, was co-opted by many government leaders throughout history, giving rise to enforced eugenics. One of the most barbaric forms of institutionalized racism, where reproduction was controlled by a militarized police. But the Bene Gesserit returned to this idea and infused it with their feminine perspective, creating a slower form of genetic improvement. According to their principles, and the principles of the Jihad, reproduction with the aid of technology was not permitted. Use the instruments only when they are absolutely required to amplify the flesh. One of the five attitudes of the Bene Gesserit way. There could be no donation of genetic material for artificial conception, and thus, consent was required. This demanded patience and planning on a larger time scale than any group had operated before. But the Bene Gesserit rose to the challenge and, to create their own higher man, 
implemented a breeding program that would not bear fruit for thousands of years. Sisters were seldom impulsive. You got ordered reactions from them even in times of peril. They went beyond what most people thought of as cultivated. They were driven not so much by dreams of power as by their own long view, a thing compounded by immediacy and almost unlimited memory. The Bene Gesserit sought as their goal not only the enlightenment and maternal rearing of all mankind, but the creation of a new humanity that would rise above its previous capacities through the leadership of one who was the result of optimal breeding for mental and physical traits. Nietzsche's Ubermensch made real. But to the Bene Gesserit, the first of these super beings had another name. The Kwisatz Haderach. A man who had the powers of Bene Gesserit other memory, and something more. In mankind's endless search through the stars, a world was found. Like Ikaz or Rossak before it, this world contained pharmacological secrets so powerful that they would reshape the landscape of the entire Imperium. The planet, home to massive creatures known as sandworms, became the home for pilgrims of many religions. But in particular, the very same wandering Zen Sunni who had given rise to the Bene Gesserit. They had found their home. Dune, also known as Arrakis, is the spiritual desert of many Earth religions magnified to the scale of an entire planet. It is the quintessential desert that one wanders into when they have lost their way, when they need to undergo a personal transformation, a hero's journey, a discovery of one's true nature and purpose. It is a place for abandoning egos, discarding one's old self, and being reborn aligned to a higher universal truth. And it is also the home of Melange. Like the drugs used by the Mentats and Bene Gesserit, it had a unique capacity for expanding the user's awareness. But also much, much more. When taken in small doses, the chemistry of this compound improved physical health and vitality, increasing human lifespan three times over. All of the old narcotics in which humans have indulged possess a remarkable factor in common, all except the spice. They all brought shorter life and pain. When taken in higher doses, it sent the user into a part of their minds capable of glimpsing the flow of time and space. In short, it provided visions of the future, according to the mind of the user. Using this newfound substance, the Spacing Guild has substituted people for the thinking machines that once navigated their ships across the reaches of space. Computer-run algorithms have been replaced by human minds augmented for swimming through the void in deep spice trance. Augmented to the point where they have become something that is no longer quite human. And with this new substance came addiction on a scale humanity had never seen. Biological necessities meshed more smoothly with Melange. Food tasted better. Barring accident or fatal assault, you lived much longer than you could without it. But you were addicted. The society that emerged after the discovery of Melange was totally dependent on the substance for its population's well-being and for interstellar travel, turning the single planet into the center of mankind's vast economic web, and making rule of Arrakis the most profitable station any great house could achieve, but also the most dangerous for there were always others lurking in the wings, ready to gain control. Each great house in Dune, as well as the various intellectual factions of the Imperium, represents certain ideologies of human actualization, from the Machiavellian industrial Harkonnens to the freedom-loving Atreides, who trace their ancestry to the poet-conquerors of ancient Greece and whose transformations over the course of the saga highlight the uncomfortable ties between democracy and totalitarianism. And it is in the House of Atreides, controlling power of the water planet Caladan, that the most important event in the history of human civilization is about to take place, unnoticed by most of the Imperium. In this house, the Lady Jessica, a Bene Gesserit assigned to the Duke Leto Atreides at the culmination of their centuries-long breeding program, 
now just two generations from achieving its Kwisatz Haderach, has done what no Bene Gesserit is permitted to do. She has fallen in love. And because of that love, rather than bearing the Bene Gesserit a daughter, the mother of the Kwisatz Haderach, she has given her duke a son. All of the events which follow, over the course of the entire Dune Saga, are born of this one decision. And the choices made by young Paul Atreides, as he comes to terms with his strange abilities. There's something happening to me. Do you often dream things that happen just as you dream them? Yes. Hey everyone, I want to thank you so much for your patience as I worked on this video. Let me say up front, every source is listed in the video description, so if you're looking for a particular shot, or want to learn more about one of the photographs or historical footage, be sure to check the description below. I also want to give a quick shout out to Chris May, who served as physics advisor for this video. He helped me as I was going through my newly acquired copy of the rare Dune Encyclopedia to determine what a Holtzman engine might look like and how it would function. Chris actually took the time to mock up one of these devices in the same software he uses to create components for the International Space Station, and that helped us immensely in making our own render of the Holtzman engine. At his request, I've included links to his AutoCAD models in the video description for anyone to download and use. In writing the script for this episode, I went through all six of Frank Herbert's Dune novels, extracting content I thought I could use in future essays. The result was a reference guide of over 300 pages, containing 42 entries pulled from all six Dune books, essentially allowing me to see some of the broader themes playing out over the course of Dune's 15,000 year narrative, without losing threads in the leap from book to book. I've put this reference guide online for anyone to use as well. If you're interested, you can find the link in the description. I invite you to edit the document, add quotes that I may have missed, and use this guide for any Dune projects you may be working on yourself. If you're looking for more Dune content while we wait for the release of the film, I have two recommendations for you. First is the video from the YouTube channel Secrets of Dune, titled Denis Villeneuve's Vision for Dune, which is just a really well-constructed documentary-style look at Villeneuve's relationship with and passion for Dune. If you liked Jodorowsky's Dune, or are skeptical about this new director's approach, give this one a watch. And second is the fantastic Quinn's Ideas, if you're looking to explore every corner of the Dune universe and its lore, this guy has the content for you. Any topic you're looking for, he's probably covered it, and it's clear he's incredibly passionate about Dune and sci-fi in general. Now, because of how wide a range of topics he covers, spoilers are abundant, so tread carefully. That's all from me for now. Can't wait to hear what everyone thinks of Dune when it releases in theaters on October 22nd in the US and October 15th internationally. Go see it on the biggest screen possible. This is a story and a director that really merits a screen to reflect the scale of Dune's world. You won't regret it. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. We'll see you in the next video.